This is my 45th year in education, so I'm an old fart. <laughs> Sorry about that, but I've learned a lot. I want to share some mistakes that I made. I want to share some successes that I have. Uh, I was deputy commissioner, and we passed landmark legislation to change the democracy of public education in the state of Maine. New Hampshire does not have a state plan, but they have a state goal, and, New, and Vermont took a look at what Maine was doing in New Hampshire and wrote a comprehensive plan, and it too passed. So there is comprehensive legislation in Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont, like the safety in numbers, and when people complain about what's going on in their state, they said, well, we're doing the same thing in New Hampshire. And then they, kind of, they started complaining about what was going on in, in Vermont. They said, well, Maine, New Hampshire are doing it, so we're going to do it too, and it's growing. Uh, all three of us are involved in the Innovation Lab Network from the Council of Chief State School Officers, which is a support base for commissioners, a support base to dare to do something different. My district, and I introduce myself as a recovering superintendent, and I mean that more literally than you can believe, that an 80-hour week was usual. And when I went to the commissionership, uh, it continued. So I've had 17 years of 80-hour weeks. I now am a consultant, and I'm working 80 days a year. <laughs> I have finally figured out how to vacation. I never knew how to do that. I had withdrawal sim symptoms this summer, and I have thoroughly enjoyed not working all summer. So what I'd like to start with is culture change. You have a life lens. You have been through grief. You have been through all the challenges life can give you. It has affected the way you process reality. You will interpret what I'm saying differently than what I mean. So please ask questions. My vocabulary. Personalization means what the student does. Individualization is what the teacher does. Student-centered learning includes agency where the kid says, I'm responsible for my learning. It's a big shift. And my presentation today will be about why we should even consider changing. And it's up on the first slide. In 1892, we invented high schools. The Committee of Ten, made up of ten college presidents in the Northeast, decided that we need secondary education so that the foremans on the assembly line had more skills to deal with other people. That was the reason for high school. And they decided that four English, two science, two math, and two social studies was necessary for people to get those skills. Unfortunately, they also announced, the integrity of the discipline shall be maintained. It shall be taught the same way to every child at the same pace every year. That was the edict. And colleges were responsible for training secondary teachers. At that time, time was a constant, learning was a variable, hope you get it. The typical spray and pray approach to education. I spray the information, I hope you get it. And move on. It was an assembly line. A nine-year-old would become a 10-year-old. A 10-year-old would become an 11-year-old. And by the way, the grade levels would be the sixth grader would become a seventh grader. Well, what do you do about remediation? Well, they can drop out at eighth grade, so don't worry about it. There was no plan for remediation. Their goal was to have 50% of the kids entering high school graduate. That was their goal. Here's a real statistic. In Maine, we graduate 87% of the freshmen that enter high school. Unfortunately, 13% of 200,000 kids is a lot of failure. We we are proud about the 87%. We don't talk about the 13. If your kid was one of the 13, you wouldn't be happy. Of, here's some more statistics for you. Of the 
47% are proficient reading, writing, and arithmetic on a single test. I take that back, on a single test, on the SAT. So take 47% of 87%, and we end up with 41 kids out of 100 graduate proficient. Maine changed the law to a proficiency-based diploma. The rubber is going to hit the road in 2018. The freshmen have already been told. We're looking at a 47% graduation rate if it's based on proficiency. So some things have to change. Time is going to not be the constant. Time is going to be a variable. Learning is going to be the constant. We're not going to take averaging for granted. You and I went to school and I apologize for putting you into a track. Every time I do a presentation, I apologize for predetermining your aspirations. Shame on me. Shame on me. But that's what the research of the day was. We predetermined people's aspirations. Said, you're not going to college. You're going to be, remember the tracks? College track? Vocational? I shout out to even share the next one with you. Homemaker? General. Oh my goodness. I look back at those days and say, how did I survive? I need, well, I, that's my problem. So this is my discipline. I can't tell all the stories I'd like to tell you. <laughs> so how does that kind of change change the culture of school? And my answer is, learning's not a competitive event. Learning is a rite of passage. When you send your kids to school, you have a right as a citizen of this country for your child to learn. How many children want to come to school to be embarrassed and insulted and so forth because they're not learning? I haven't met one yet, but we do that all the time. Here's the difference. I started out as a civil engineer. I have an anal brain. I am causal. I was black and white until I had children. <laughs> and in engineering, I had an industrial mentality. That was the committee of 10. Things are very specific. They should be black and white. There should be a 45 minute period and you shall do that seven times a day and the bus will come and pick you up and bring you home. Relationships are not a matter to be discussed. And then I'm preaching this one. That's hard for me. That's very hard for me. As a principal, I had to control the number of minutes between classes because those little buggers would go in the, in the bathrooms and start smoking. So you cut it down by 30 seconds so they don't have time to light up. And you try to control all those variables. Nah, you make them in charge of the school. And I disagree with Michael Horn. I have never lost an argument when I had kids defend the concept in public. $250,000 increase in the budget for laptops. Kids came to my budget meeting, took on the public. Give me another one, come on. And they would ask the public what concerns they had about their future. And they asked the public, do you believe in us or not? One kid said, I'm gonna grow up and I'm going to have to make decisions about your retirement. <laughs> he got attention to everyone. So anytime, anywhere. We didn't have this technology in the 70s and 80s. We have it now. So in the state of Maine, we put together a plan and promised superintendents we would stop lurching. Every year we had the greatest idea going and we came up with it, and two years later, we took the funding out because we didn't think it was going to work. And superintendents were sick of that. We are willing to support innovation. We're willing to support culture change. We're willing to take the hard decisions to our public. But be consistent. Don't keep changing on us. So we put a plan together. We brought it to the superintendents. We said, critique it. 
They edited it, they gave it back to us, we put it to the legislature, the legislature adopted it, and we sent it out to the world. This is our plan for eight years. We will not change it. And here are our priorities. Bang, bang, bang. This PowerPoint is on the website for this organization. So you can use it, and I have notes underneath to tell you what each slide means, all right? So the priorities over here was kids. You have to do it so it's intuitive. Don't ask people to read it. You can't read that slide from where you're sitting. But who's the most important person on that slide? That little kid on that left side. And the world revolves around that kid. It was intuitive. We put it out there, people loved it. They loved that the department, for the first time in history, had a strategic plan. It created some confidence. We were able to pass legislation because of it. I'm here to tell you about competency-based education. There are five tenets to it, and it has to be implemented with fidelity. Some of my colleagues in Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont say, oh yeah, we're doing that. No, you're not. And here's one thing I learned after I got out of the superintendency. Ron Heifetz wrote a book called Leadership on the Line. It should be a Bible for any and every change agent. Amazon, 22 bucks. Leadership on the Line, last name Heifetz, H-E-I-F-T-Z. And here they are. This is modeled after INACOL, and the CCSSO group supported INACOL's research. Mastery or proficiency? And that's another vocabulary word. Proficiency of standards. Mastery is kind of scary. I don't think I've ever mastered a concept when I was going through school. What does mastery mean? What does proficiency mean? So we'll get into that. Kid-friendly curriculum. That's my interpretation of explicit, measurable objectives. If you're going to have 24-7 learning, kids have to understand our jargon. It can't be written in professorial terms. It has to be their language at their maturation level or grade level or whatever you want to call it. Assessment has to be meaningful. My buddy over here answers all my what questions. If there's a phrase you can take back to your district, nobody wants what anymore. That's a level one DOK, the depth of knowledge is a regurgitation of facts, figures, names, states, faces, and places. I shudder to think that in the 70s, in the high school I was responsible for, a social studies teacher had an 85 test which challenged your memory of all the rivers, mountains, capitals, and countries, and presidents of South America. And the kids said, we don't give a rat's behind about the information you just asked us, so I'm sorry. We're going to forget this the minute I pass that 85 test. And they did. Well, next week, the presidents and the boundaries of the countries changed. So it was a new 85 test, and it was never, ever the same. Next one, taxonomy and executive skills. We built a rubric, not on frequencies, and I'll show you a slide in a minute. An A, our current system in A is a better B, and a B is a better C, and a C is a better D. It's a frequency. What is the frequency of your correct answers? Then we build rubrics. Seldom, usually, often, always. That's the same scale. If you build a rubric on a taxonomy of a four, a three, a two, and a one, you can go back and relearn stuff anytime you want. If a kid was satisfied with a three in November and decides he wants a four in February, and a four is a different skill than a three, let him go. And we would go back and change grades. Curriculum had to be transparent. And I'm skipping around. Customized instruction, not a one size fits all. If this were a typical seventh grade, because I don't have another name for it, and I got in trouble with the feds because I did away with some grade levels, uh, this would be uh, late sixth grade. This would be early seventh grade. This would be middle seventh grade. This would be late seventh grade, and that would be early eighth grade. 
and I could go around and do little seminars with each of you, and you would overhear me speaking just to make sure you understood what was going on at that table, and you'd move on. It's a differentiated approach. We kept the age levels and their peers and their friends together, but we differentiated to the point where we really didn't have grade levels. We had a continuum. And you would just move on that continuum. It's almost like entering school at four, we had pre-K, and leaving when you're done. Our elementary school was like that. Our middle schools became that way. And the biggest problem we had as administrators, kids are out of grade level. We had some fifth graders doing seventh grade work. We had some seventh graders doing ninth and tenth grade work. The problem is they couldn't get high school credit. The statute said you had to be enrolled in high school to accumulate enough credits to graduate. So I wrote a waiver. Dear Commissioner, we have kids accelerating because we have done away with the barriers. I'd like to have credit for algebra one and geometry for some of my seventh and eighth graders. No answer, no answer. A year goes by, I retire from the superintendency and I go to the department as deputy. It's on my desk! <laughs> Approved! And therefore the whole state saw what one district did and they became under the same uh, provision. So now we're moving forward. A lot of kids are finishing high school at the end of the sophomore year which means we trained our high school staff to be adjunct professors at schools like Kobe, Bates, and Bowdoin, and the kids would go to an Ivy League school in high school, and they would graduate with a transcript and a diploma. Not a completed transcript, but both. Okay, here's the INACOL definition. I'll leave that for later, and I'll go into more um, explicit terms. Mastery, what does mastery mean? So student choice of evidence. When we talk about student voice and choice, it's not a free-for-all. They have a voice. They have an opinion. And we ask them, and they'll tell you. And I want to introduce you to something that's on the CCSSR website about five questions. You ask kids five questions, and you ask them part one and part two of each question. What is the most important aspect about learning? And they'll tell you. Is it manifest in your school? And they'll tell you. And what we found is, high percentage of kids had an opinion over here, but a very low percentage of implementation. And you share that with staff, and they'll look at kids' opinions, and it's enough to leverage your resistors to get moving. When kids speak, adults listen. Uh, DOK levels is proficiencies, uh, extended learning opportunities, um, Boy Scouts, 4-H, YMCA, all school, uh, uh, church, there's all kinds of learning that happen 24 7 everywhere. Everywhere. So when your curriculum is posted electronically, it's transparent so kids can see all the measurement topics and learning targets that exist. They say, I did that in 4 H. Can I bring in my evidence and get credit for it? Yes, you can. And they get pretty savvy about it. They say, I have to write a, persuas a persuasive essay in English, and it's about the topic I'm doing in social studies. Can I do one paper and get credit for both? Absolutely. They're more savvy about it than teachers are. We, de we develop curriculum in silos. We don't know what our neighbors are doing. We don't know what the K-12 curriculum in social studies looks like. But ELA should. Our literature should be aligned with that reading in social studies, wouldn't it make sense to kids? You've achieved relevancy. So here's a note that won't be on any slide. R to the third power. Relationships first. If you had a favorite teacher, be that person. I had a favorite teacher that they said, Don, I think you can do better. Yeah, OK, I'll do it. Just the, somebody that believed in me? I would move forward, I'd move the earth in order to get their approval. Relevancy. Their world and our world, big difference. If you can make it relevant, they will see the value in it. And then you can approach rigor. If you start with rigor, you turn them off, day one. Uh, there's no start and stop of the year. Grade levels become obsolete. 
So in June, if you're not done, you're not done. You're incomplete. You can go web. You can go to the posted curriculum and do it on your own. You can come to finishing school one day a week during the summer. You can log into Khan Academy. You can do whatever in order to produce evidence to say that you've met those measurement topics. Or you learn a lesson about life. If you procrastinate, you'll have a double load come September. And kids who have a double load or have an incomplete are ineligible. And the coaches don't want anybody to be ineligible. They have a study period before practice. The team helps one another make sure that they're never ineligible. Talk about leverage. Seminars, the grouping practice and pace change because you have kids in performance groups. We took a K-5, a pre-K-5 school, and we went to performance grouping and reading. This is everybody had a reading group. The secretary, the art teacher, the music teacher, the science, the special ed, whatever. Group of five. What can you do with 90 minutes with a group of five? You can find deficits, you can correct deficits, you can move forward. Our proficiency rating went from 58 to 88 percent just by paying attention to a customized approach. Explicit curriculum to empower students. Transparent and posted, the measurement topics. Kids will speak this way. You ask kids four questions and go into a classroom. What are you learning? Why is that important? How do you know when you've learned it? And what do you do when you get stuck? And they articulate, and that's the beginning of agency. When they start taking responsibility for those four questions, you end up with a culture change where the kids are in charge of their pace. They don't want to not be with their buds, so they keep up with a bunch of stuff. Oh, gee. Taxonomy versus frequency-based rubrics, integrated units, external learning opportunities, and I mentioned Boy Scouts. This is my prop. Anybody remember what this is? This isn't. Can you see it? Paul Simon wrote a song about it. This is Kodachrome. Kodakolor. I used to take four rolls of 24 to get one picture for the Christmas card with three kids and a dog looking the same way. And here they are. That many pictures to find one for the Christmas card. Okay? Do you know who invented this? Do you know what this is? This is a chip that goes into my digital camera. You know who invented it? Kodak invented it. You know when Kodak went out of business? The fall of 16, the fall of 13. They declared bankruptcy. They invented the chip. The chip put them out of business because they said the world will keep taking pictures on plastic film. They did not see the future. Folks, public education is still making plastic film. Got to join the world of the enlightened. I don't want to be put out of business. I believe in the pluralism. I believe in kids' voice and listening to what they have to say. This is the merit badge. And when you take a merit badge, it's 24-7 learning. You get a syllabus for every one of these little badges. You do this learning on your calendar, mm -hmm. not between four walls. You do it anytime, everywhere, with a community expert. And then what do you do as a little 11 and 12 year old? I go to a review board of three to four adults, and they interview me to see if I'm faking it. I have to produce evidence. How do I produce evidence that I went fishing and caught a fish, not my father? Right here. I take a picture. I can authenticize everything that I do. And then I go through an inquisition called an interview. 
And then I go through some kinesthetic demonstrations where I have to show them how I can fly fish, or I show them how I can cast, or I identify fish, and I, I know the pH differences between the top and the bottom of the lake and the temperatures. Maine is going through a drought right now. The top of the lakes are extremely warm. The fish have to go in the bottom to survive because the water is cold. Yeah, they ask you those questions. It's really amazing. And you get a badge for it. You get enough badges, you get an award. Suppose we did that with public education. Interesting thought. Measure it. You heard Michael Horn talk about for and of. I'm speaking as a performance assessment is learning. A great performance assessment is something a student will never forget. I have a capstone project that we started in 2005. The teacher, after five years, interviewed kids after they had graduated. They went to law school. They went to filmmaking school. They went all over the place. And they used that capstone project as an exemplar to college admissions. Here's what I am. Here's what I can do. And the resulting summary, I did something so hard, and I did it so well. 18-year-old says, I think I could do anything now. What a nice attitude for a graduate to have when they leave school. Relevant and authentic life experiences. You can put those into performance assessments. And I want to show you the slide. This is Linda Darling Hammond's slide. These are the achievement tests. These are the one week, two week, two month, all year projects. And you put a performance assessment together and you have exemplars to, com to compare it to. The Innovation Lab Network has a resource bank. The New York Consortium for Performance Assessment has a resource bank. Colorado has a resource bank. It is becoming the norm. So I am provoking a conversation to say, could we have a collection of performance assessments, evidence of diploma, instead of credits? Could kids do performance assessments instead of sit and get in classrooms? Customized instruction. RTI that addresses skills deficits, not homework. A lot of people are doing an RTI block in their seven period day and they're doing homework completion. Well, advisory. So you've got to build a relationship with the kids so that they'll believe you when you're saying, I'm here to help. Personalization is student ownership of learning. That's why we're doing it. An immediate and focused intervention. Don't wait for the end of a quiz. Have an intervention the day of the quiz or the day of a test. And oh, by the way, everything's formative. And my analogy is like a soccer game. At the end of the first period, you have a score, not terminal. You still coach, you still change, you substitute people in and out, you change your approach, you change your attack, you change your defense. End of the second period, not terminal, still formative. You make some more changes. End of the third period, that's terminal. There's no more time left and it's over. It's a process of formative. When we adopted this process, we asked the kids, we told the kids, everything is formative until you say you're done. And when you're done, that's it. We'll put it on the transcript. Deeper learning and dispositions. I'm going to spend some time on this one because dispositions is coming strong. Deeper learning. Never mind multiple choice, never mind true and false, never mind fill in the blank. Siri can answer all of those questions for me in a second. I don't have to keep it up here. I have to use that information. Using that information is essential. So the depth of knowledge is a proficiency level. So level one is recall. Level two is comprehension. Level three is analysis, compare, contrast, personal opinion. Level four is create, invent, innovate. Level five, which we seldom talk about, is taking your study and bringing it to the public. We have kids that did a study on recycling, brought it to the city council, answered all the questions city council had, answered questions about how much it would cost, asked questions about who would pick it up and deposit it, answered questions about the return on the investment, answered questions about what we would get paid for the recycled material. So much so that the adults were stumped. 
Motion second vote, they adopted the whole idea of recycling in an entire city. That's a level five. That's affecting the pluralism. That's phenomenal stuff. 21st century, we hear soft skills, we hear uh, non-cognitive. I have a father-in-law who's 90 years old. My wife and I went to court, the probate judge awarded us conservatorship and guardianship because he's lost his executive functions. I have adopted that term because it's a medical term instead of an educational jargon term. Medical functions, Google executive functions and you will find, next slide, you will find that they describe eight important executive functions, and those could be your habits of mind. Art Costa identified and copyrighted his habits of mind. So if you use them, there's a copyright problem. Maine has something called guiding principles. The guiding principles were adopted into law in 97, but everybody inferred, oh yeah, we do those. Uh, a person has to be a clear and effective communicator. Well, that's what English language arts is about. Do you ever ask kids to apply it? Do you ever ask kids to do a public exhibit? Do you ever ask kids to present for the school board? That's a demonstration of being a clear and effective community. A self-directed lifelong learner, creative practic and practical problem solver, a responsible citizen, an integrative and informed thinker. How do you assess that stuff? It's a habit. It isn't a single event. It's a performance assessment. It's done over time. And we have disaggregated all that information in the report card because teachers put in class participation, uh, group work, uh, volunteering, effort, conduct, and we merge that all stuff together, okay? So I'm gonna pick on Larry for a minute. Larry and I are in the third grade. Larry gets A's. Don gets C's. Don's parents say, ah, oh, we're gonna work with you. After school, you're gonna sit down at the kitchen table and we're gonna work with you. Now we're in the fourth grade. Larry gets A's, Don gets C's. Don's parents say, well, oh, that didn't work. Let's hire somebody. We'll hire a tutor, come in after dinner. So you go out for her and play around and then come in after dinner and we'll have a structured study for you. Now Larry and I are in the fifth grade. Larry gets A's, Don gets C's, Don's got it figured out. Larry's smart, Don's not. I go into middle school. I act crazy, because my hormones are going crazy. I'm dysfunctional for a while. I hit my freshman year, I struggle, because I have a Swiss cheese background. It's full of holes. I don't understand, because here's how we went through school. I got a 90, a 90, a 90, and a 10. 270 plus 10 is 280, divide by four. 70, I pass. Wrong. The next year, that 10 haunts me because the teacher builds on that 10. So then I get a 90 and 90 and two 30s. Oh, I struggle. I go into RTI block. The next year, I still haven't fixed that deficit. It infects everything until I hit my sophomore year. Sophomore year, I figure out mathematically I can't graduate. What do I do? See you, folks. 10% of our 13% of kids that didn't finish high school left in the sophomore year. It's us, we're the ones that have to change. So the guiding principles have to be explicitly taught and assessed through performance and demonstration. This is a taxonomy. Boy, it's a poor slide. Um, this is our ABC system. A, B, C, D, same skill. Here's our taxonomy. A one, two, three, four. If that's too much for your public to accept, and it's difficult because grading is a holy grail, you can go A, B, revise, do over. But they're different skills. Your parents have graduated, you graduated with this. A is a better B, B is a better C, and so on. Now we're talking about different skills. So if in November I do some of these verbs, and I hit a level of proficiency on a measurement topic, and I say, I did pretty good at that. I think, I think I'll go for a four. 
It's a different skill. It's not the same test. It's a different skill. And that's what made sense. So were your highly educated, articulate, squeaky wheel parents who want an oppressive experience for their children. And I was criticized because school wasn't oppressive. Uh, I showed them this and they said, so you, we can move on? Yes. Think about what an honors course is all about. Level four. Every course could have been an honors program. The kid could elect to get all fours instead of threes. And they would get an honors credit. And our highly educated, squeaky wheel, articulate parents love that idea. You can't see this one, but this is a kid-friendly GPS of our curriculum. Over here, this is what a one, a two is. This is a three, there's a taxonomy, and there's a kid-friendly language. Change is really hard because it's about things that I'm comfortable knowing. And culture change is really difficult because you're changing the democracy of public education. What we have was invented in 1892. I'm going to challenge you with a quote from Tony Wagner in the back of the book, the very last line of the book, The Global Achievement Gap. He said, if not you, then who? If not now, then when? And it's a quote from Rabbi Hillel in the 18th century. If not you, then who? If not now, then when? And it's haunted me ever since I read that book. It's time to do something different. The assembly line, one size fits all, doesn't work for kids. And our economy is going to be affected. I can't tell you all the job wanted ads we have in the Northeast. Not for grunt work, skilled labor. We have paper mills in the Northeast. Well, excuse me, we still have some paper mills in the Northeast. They used to employ 2,000 people. High wages, grunt work. Now we have new and improved paper mills. 200 employees making 100K each because they run highly technical machines that make paper at a mile a minute. It's an interesting change very interesting change and we have to share that with our kids. So here's the reason. We have a, a tension. We have a serious tension between what we want out of school and what we do in school. I have probably done 20 future searches with different communities. The top 10 things parents want out of school, nine are effective. One is cognitive. What do we report on our report card? Cognition. We never get to the effective. Think of your position as a parent. You send a kid to school. I want my kid to be safe. I want them to be, ha I want them to make friends. I want them to be respected. I want to have their voice heard. I want them to have an efficacy about themselves. And they go into middle school and high school. You want them to stop being responsible for themselves, being prompt and courteous. Well, there was a workforce summit in Springdale last spring that came out with five habits that entry-level employees must have. In 2012, the commissioner and I, at a commissioner's conference, invited 150 superintendents and 20 CEOs from the biggest businesses in the Northeast. And we asked the CEOs what was the most essential skills for entry-level employment. Getting along with other people. Initiative. Problem solving. Analysis. Find your own resources. Solve some problems. Quote, we have never ever looked at a transcript. We hire because of those executive functions. And we fire because people can't get along with one another. They have no discreteness about their language. And Maine has a Embarrassing governor. I wish he would follow the guiding principles Maine has. You have a governor that F-bombs news reporters. If he were in my 
school system, I'd suspend him. Tell me, go home. Have your mother wash your mouth out. Come back to school, we'll try it again. Huh. Creative tension between what we want and what we do. And that's your culture change. And if you are change agents, it's time to do it. And it's time to have a conversation. Transformation happens one conversation at a time. You can't just do it. And here is my interpretation of 45 years of education. Quickly, this is the change process. This is human dynamics. And I hope it makes sense to you. These are quadrants of the change cycle. You need to know the answer to the what question. You need to inform curriculum, instruction, and assessment. That's a level one skill. Answering purpose and meaning, that's a why question. That's a level two, understanding. Look who's in charge of that. It's called pedagogy. The definition of pedagogy is directed learning. You don't have a choice. I am directing your learning. That's called pedagogy. Teacher directed. There is a place for teacher directed learning. This is the unlearning process. And if your public doesn't unlearn, there is no place for the new synapses to put the new information. They will be totally confused unless they go through an unlearning process. The example that's used are Harvard graduates being asked, is the sun closer to the earth in the winter or the summer? Based on reality, I get closer to a heat source, I can feel the heat. So if the sun is closer to me in the summertime when it's warm, instead of the wintertime when it's cold, that's intuitive. Wrong. The sun is closest to the earth in the winter. Because of the angle of the sun, it bounces off. The infrared rays bounce off. In the summertime, we're at a 90 degree angle and it hits us directly and it's absorbed into the mass called Earth. Now, my, my intuitiveness says, no, it's hotter in the summer than it is in the winter. Come on. So I resist. When I resist, I am demonstrating I'm actually thinking. So when you get resistance, it's an indication you're doing it right. I didn't know that until after the whole process was over. It's an end. I thought 200 people come to a board meeting? Ah! They're angry? <laughs> it's an indication, it's an opportunity to teach that lesson because they're paying attention. Unlearning process. Then you pass the torch. It's a transition of control. You give it up. The learning process has to belong to the student. You give it up, it's over here, it's personalized, it's their voice, it's their choice of evidence, it's their different pathway. They select it. A two-page paper isn't evidence for everything. My way is not evidence for the best way to learn. I'm a linear sequential thinker. I became a math physics major because my math teacher, who was linear sequential, said, you'd do well in math. You should be a teacher. I have no idea how to teach math to a random abstract person. I just don't. I was never taught that. I don't know that. But over here, I would ask that person how they learn best. And then I would go after. And then agency. Agency is a quadrant four. That's a level four. I'm in charge of myself. It's application. It's creation of information and knowledge. I can do that. And over here, this is the norming process. So you have informing, storming, and it really gets stormy. Then norming, it becomes the norm. And I have a quote from one of the principals in Springdale. What used to be overwhelming is now routine. There's a tsunami that comes, and then it quickly goes down. There's some research done on change. The human being will tolerate 15% of their routine being changed. After that, they think it's a crisis. So you have to think, do I go for 20, 25? The resistance is going to be the same. Or do you keep them constantly irritated with around 10 or 12% change, 10 or 12% change, 10 or 12% change? Well, I kept a very large community irritated for five years. 
But guess what happened? They owned the change. There wasn't a board member that wanted to repeal everything that we have done because the whole community was involved. That was a five-year conversation, intense, but all about learning. When do communities talk about learning? They talk about budgets all the time, but we talked about learning constantly, and they got up to the performance level. This is what I'd like to hand out to you, and there is no roadmap. Oh boy, oh boy. If you have a computer, it's posted okay. on that URL that they gave you. Uh, are there teams here? Are there more than one person from a district? <gasps> so, let me give you a snapshot about what you're looking at. I cannot help you develop a strategic plan for your district. I can give you the tenets that should be included in a plan, but I can't tell you the sequence. I don't know your culture. We went through force consolidation school districts in Maine. I have six towns in my district. Every one of them's different. You think they were neighbors, they talked to one another. No. I had to treat every one of them different. It was amazing. And so it is for you folks too. There's a culture change. You are processing your lens from your culture and your community with what I'm sharing with you. This is a tool which I think is outstanding. I have never found anything like this. There are 48 attributes of culture change. The green says the culture change from tradition to transition is going to be easy. The yellow means it's cautious. Pay attention to it. Cautious, you may have to back step a little bit and start again. The red says it's going to be difficult. And there are 30 attributes of um, operations and management of a school system, and 18 about culture change. I share that with you to simply pay attention to these things so you don't get ambushed. Your school community thinks that they write the vision for your school system. Wrong. You get everybody in the community you can possibly get to share in the writing of that vision. And then you ask your teachers in your building, how are we going to address that? That's called a mission statement. So there's a vision for the district, there's a mission for your building. Your building has the autonomy, purpose, and mastery of coming up with a mission statement and a strategic plan to meet that vision. When that vision becomes policy, it is hard for another superintendent to come in and disregard it. There have been two superintendents after me in the district I left seven years ago. They took the vision statement, they clarified their position on the vision statement, they put it out in the application. If you believe in this vision, please apply. If you don't, we're not even going to give you an interview. And they found people who believe passionately in that same vision. So I'm going to tell you, that little sheet of paper in front of you, that packet, takes 10 years. Culture change is a decade. There's a quote from Seymour Saracen. He said, as much as things change, things remain the same. Your bus schedule, your football schedule, your after school learning programs, those are things. Real change happens when people, so you're the first. You're the only one you can change. Leadership is about influence and persistence. I have a passion for this mission. I persisted for 45 years. Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont have adopted it. I was a member of the Innovation Lab Network that went from 6 to 16. We're going to get to a tipping point real soon, and everyone's going to be talking about performance assessments instead of multiple choice. People are going to talk about student voice because they want responsible citizens leaving school. Number one dropout reason for kids entering college, no time management. School of hard knocks. 
geez, I just invested $50,000 in the, I, I dropped out in, in Thanksgiving. Well, that's a great investment. Maine did this law because the number of kids that went to college, 60% of them did under 100 courses, which don't count. So you're paying $50,000 a year for courses that don't count. So we said, back it up. A diploma will mean something now. You will leave school, I don't care how long it takes, and we're gonna have to change things like attendance. Attendance is the bodies at the four walls. We have kids on internships that don't come to school. Are they in attendance? We have kids doing external learning credit. Do you count that as seat time? No. We did away with seat time. We did away with credit. We said each district come up with a definition of proficiency and live with it. You guys make that decision. Every culture is different. <sighs> Last couple of slides. Here's my purpose of education. Learning how to learn. I want every kid to graduate high school having learned how to learn. We had employers saying, technology is disrupting everything I do. I have to retool my machinery every five years. If my employees don't know how to learn, they're out of a job. These are four of my six grandkids. They're on uh, an abandoned dock. I have a very nice boat. I have eight kayaks, two canoes, and a piece of junk. And they play on the piece of junk. They play pirates on the piece of junk. They learned about Archimedes' principle of water displacement. They learned about propulsion. They learned about teamwork. One was paddling to the left on one side, the other one was paddling to the right on the other side. They started going in a circle. They said, wait a minute here, we gotta get organized. And then they all got on one end and started tipping. They said, wait, 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 you get over there. We gotta balance this. They were learning. It was discovery learning. How long did they play on that thing? From seven o'clock in the morning until it gets dark at eight o'clock at night. I was upset. Grampy said, I need to play with you, come on. So I get in my kayak and I attacked them. <laughs> pirate ship, I figured I'd attack a pirate ship, right? And they all jumped off and flipped my kayak over and said, go away, and got back on and <laughs> kept playing. So here are my pirates, and there are the six of them, and this is an old picture there, it's about two years old now. We all have attitudes, beliefs, and values. My attitudes change when I pull into traffic. I could be a nice human being as I'm approaching a highway, but if I have to pull into traffic going 70, 80 miles an hour, I go through a metamorphosis. Don't talk to me. I turn the radio off. I change <laughs> beliefs. I have some pretty deep set beliefs, but if I respect you and you respect me and you tell me your beliefs and I tell you my beliefs, I move my stake a little closer to yours and you move yours a little closer to mine because I respect who I'm talking to. That's that one conversation at a time. My values, here they are. I'll die in the hill for my values. I won't change those. So please, don't waste your time talking about my values. But my attitudes and belief do change. And here is the lesson learned. Springdale had a summer institute where we invited 25 kids to share their perspective of reality. And they said, what makes a great and ideal classroom? When teachers care, food, teachers fun personality, more field trips, engaged teachers who wanna help, Teachers sparking student interest, when teachers talk like a friend, student-teacher relationships, in essence, they don't care how much we know until they know how much we care. That is the basis of teaching. That's that first R in my R to the third part, relationships. You need a relationship, you need a time, you need an advisory period, you need a homeroom period, you need to do stupid things. Like decorate your door at Halloween or yeah, just stuff like that so you have an identity. My daughter was in an advisory for four years. She graduated in 1995. Last year, they had their 20th high school reunion. 
they called each other up, made sure that each of the advisories were going to attend. A 20-year relationship. They became advisors for one another. There were some kids in the advisory who just wanted to drop out of school, and they said, you drop out of school, we're going to kick your sorry butt. We're, we're going to go get you. We're going to do this. They didn't show up at school. They'd leave school in their cars. They'd go and get them. they knock them, pound on the door. Get up out of bed. Come on, you're going to school. And they became surrogate parents for one another. 20 years later, they valued that relationship. And that's it, ladies and gentlemen. I need to take a break because I got CBE2 coming up. Thank you. <laughs>